Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind. Remember to subscribe to our free podcast so you won't miss any of our illuminating content. Here is episode 159. When I had to realize that the only way I could heal and the only way I could become someone in something new was to take accountability for what it was that I'd done that led me to that moment in time. Benjamin Franklin once said, Do not curse the darkness, rather light a candle instead. If you are ready to set your mind on fire, then prepare yourself for the Luminous Mind with your host, Rebecca Bowman. Today's fire starter is Kevin Clayson. Kevin is the chief officer of Awesome and is known for dancing and rapping his way into the heart of audiences all across North America as a highly requested and highly rated professional youth and corporate speaker. Kevin's new book, Flipping the Gratitude Switch, while receiving universal praise, is already being heralded in the professional development and business communities as one of the most important life success books ever. Kevin is one of the founders of the revolutionary multi-million dollar real estate investment and international personal development company that has been successfully operating out of Utah for over a decade. He is a dedicated family man who always says that no matter what happens professionally, nothing will ever be as important as the work he does inside the four walls of his home with the four people he loves the most, his beautiful wife and three adorable children. Thank you so much for joining us today, Kevin. Oh my gosh, are you kidding me? Thank you for letting me come on and hang out with you. This is awesome. <laughs> this is guaranteed to be the most awesome podcast because we have the chief officer of yeah. awesome joining us today, right? Yeah, that's so, right. Hey, and if you ever want to hear an awesome voice message, call my cell phone. I think that I say the word awesome about 20 <laughs> times inside of 60 seconds. That's great. That is awesome. <laughs> Well, great. I'm excited to learn, also learn more about how, you know, we're going to flip that gratitude switch. But before we get into all of that, please tell our audience a little bit more about yourself. Yeah, sure. No problem. Thank you again for having me. I think what you do here is amazing. And uh, it's just such a such an honor to be with you and to have people listening to this. Thank you so much. So I grew up in California and uh, lived in California for about 20 years. I went and served a mission for my church in Germany, came back to Utah was just going to school, didn't know what the heck I was going to do. Uh, ended up getting married super young. And uh, like right when I got home from my mission, well, that ended about three and a half years later in a shocking revelation that my now ex-wife was in love with one of my best friends. That's always wow. fun. By yeah. the way, that's, that's, always, that's always a good day. And so oh, gosh. it kind of shifted things for me. You know, I had kind of thought I knew where life was going. And then all of a sudden, nope. Rug got tugged out from underneath me, and it caused me to sort of shift everything. And uh, what I ended up doing is is starting a path that led me to start a company with a couple buddies of mine, which is the company you mentioned called Strongbrook. And uh, you know we've been owning, we've kind of owned and been operating that company for about a decade. And what's really great about that is it's given me this amazing opportunity to move into the space that I'm in now which is I don't even do much with my company anymore because I'm so focused on getting this message out into the world. So yeah, I wrote the book called Flip the Gratitude Switch. You know, I'm doing a lot of speaking um, on that. And I cannot tell you how called to that work I feel. It is just incredible to do what I do. So now I live in Orem, Utah with my, um, I, I did get remarried, by the way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we've been married for almost 10 years. My wife is incredible. In fact, we just passed our, 10 year first date anniversary last week. Wow. So how about that, huh? And he's got and the, some cute kids, right? Got some amazing <laughs> kids. My daughter is seven and learning Chinese, by the way. So oh what about gosh. that? <laughs> yeah. And that's just because I only want her to speak Chinese because I really like Chinese food. And I figure if she speaks it, <laughs> She'll cook it better. I don't know if it's going to work. We'll see. <laughs> and then I've got a I've got a five year old little boy and uh, and a two year old boy who's about to be three. And so that's what we do. We just get to have fun, hang out, be a family guy, go speak, and try to share this book and this message with as many as possible because I know it's a game changer. Yeah. Well, let's talk about. I want to hear kind of the journey. You know, of how you came to discover what you love to do now. You know, how did you find that mission and passion? That's such a great question, and it really was a journey. I mean. 
When we started our company, I had no idea what it meant to be a business owner, none, like zero. And in fact, it was especially difficult for me because I was kind of suffering under what, uh, there's a man who I greatly respect, his name is David A. Bednar, and he has this phrase that I love, and he says that many of us suffer from what he calls the poverty of endless discontentment. Oh, that's for and, sure. <laughs> and that, oh my gosh, that was American me. American right? way of life. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. The job wasn't good enough. We're not making enough money as a company. My car's not good enough. My house isn't good enough. Nothing's good enough. And so, by the way, when you're a business owner and you're constantly looking at things as victimizing you always, right? Like that client didn't do the right thing and this lender didn't pan out and my business partners are blah, blah, blah. When you're constantly in a state of victimhood, you can create nothing awesome. It just doesn't happen. <laughs> Because you don't think you can affect it because you feel like everything's affecting you. And, man, that was the lane I lived in. I was just – I was so entrenched in that lifestyle because I'd never been taught anything different. Well, in about 2009, I'm like, okay, I guess I need to kind of change myself because I sort of started to realize that wasn't working for me. And that's when I entered the world of personal development, just reading books and trying to go to seminars and learning and and all of this stuff. And I got I, – I was able to learn a lot and it began to shift my life. But those sort of thoughts and ideas hadn't really taken root in my heart yet, which I came to find out when in about 2010, we made this hire for our company who did not like me. And he ended up sort of, even though I was one of the owners of the company, he kind of became like my boss because we were starting this other company underneath the umbrella of the existing one. And he was kind of running that company. And my primary day-to-day -day task was inside of that company. It was a network marketing company that we were starting. And um, he kind of became my boss, but he did not like me. I, as a result, did not like him. And we would get in these full-fledged shouting matches. Oh. I, I was traveling all over the country because I just think he wanted me outside. I used to think that he would send me out to travel and speak all <laughs> over the country because I was so good at what I do. Look, I'm pretty sure he was just like, let's get this dude out of the office, right? Like, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> And so I was traveling a lot. I was tired. We just had our, our first boy and he was not sleeping through the night. And so I was just exhausted and I became really depressed because nothing was good enough. All the personal development stuff. And by the way, this is, I think, a really important point, Rebecca, is when we get to a point where we feel like there's nothing left, we don't know what else to do. We'll have people that will come to us and tell us about this book or this idea or even try to remind us of something we've learned in a book or at a seminar. But what most people don't understand unless they've been in that place is, is nothing that anybody can refer to you. No book, no message is going to have the impact that you need it to have in order to sort of pull you out of that trench and pull you out of that hole. I, I say in the book that you know when you've hit rock bottom – because it's that moment where you only have two choices. One is to say, screw it all, I'm done. Or the other is to finally find the strength to do that one thing different that you know you've needed to do but been unable to do up to that point. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, I have a friend that says it's kind of like trying to put frosting on a cow pie. You know, until you can change that, right. inner, that inner core, no matter, you know, Doesn't what matter. feel good stuff you're doing, it, it's not going to make a huge difference. Yeah, it's so true. And I got to that point and all that stuff that I'd learned and read, it didn't matter because I was at a point where nothing was good enough. I was victimized by everyone and everything. All the personal development stuff that I'd read, it didn't matter because they didn't understand my life, right? I'm in a different position. And I kind of got to that point of rock bottom and I'm like, I don't know what to do. I literally wanted to run away. I just wanted to be done, get away from it all. And, oh, wow. and it was in that moment, Rebecca, when the most incredible thing happened. And this is why I'm such an advocate of reading books and going to seminars because, you know, even if you're reading a book or going to a seminar or listening to a speaker and what they have to say isn't necessarily the right thing for you right now, if it can plant this seed in your heart, in your soul, in your brain, you may get to that point of rock bottom and in that moment – you may find that little tiny glimmer of hope that you need by remembering an idea that you learned maybe years before. That's for sure. And, yeah. and that's what happened to me. And I remembered this talk that I'd heard about this idea of gratitude. 
And I'd grown up in a household that, you know, I mean, we would say we're thankful for stuff when we would pray, but I never knew what gratitude was. I was operating under the misconception that many of us are, that gratitude is like this touchy feely thing that just kind of this emotional thing that when things are going good, we just (laughs) feel awesome. Like, and I didn't know what it was, but I went on this journey and as I embarked on this journey just to find a little bit more happy in my life. I just needed a little bit more joy and I just wanted, everybody talked about being happy and so I wanted to find happy. And as I embarked on that journey, nothing was working. I didn't know what to do so I thought maybe I'll focus on this gratitude thing. And it was through that process that I created what became the formula for the book, what became some of the terms that I coin in the book and what became the biggest single life trajectory changing thing ever which is learning that gratitude is something that you do, not just something that you feel. And that moment when I started to figure that out, what happened is my life started to go in this amazing trajectory. I didn't plan on writing a book. I didn't plan on sharing this message with the world. But you asked, how did I find my mission? I had to get to the point where there was nothing left. And I had to look for that one glimmer of hope and then choose that instead of giving in to the darkness, I'm going to focus on that one speck of light and try to see if there's something there that I can grasp onto. And that single decision has now opened up the rest of my life and put me in a place where I never have a bad day. I know that seems like a bold claim, but I truly don't because of what I've been able to figure out and discover. And it has totally changed my family. And it's now changing lives all across the country from this one little tiny idea that gratitude is something you do, not something you feel. And that by feeling active gratitude inside of life's frustrations, when they happen, your entire life can change. Yeah, I love that. We're going to talk more about like some action steps and stuff that he talks about in his book. But I really want to hear like, did you have some challenges? I mean, we talked about a little bit about, you know, feeling really cruddy and everything. But what were some challenges that you had along the way? And what do you feel like you learned from those? You know, the challenges were moments, right? And I think that I always like to look at life and I like to break it down into moments. And I remember this one moment when I had to be, this actually happened a couple times, my business partners would come to me and say, Kev, you're not cutting it. You're not doing what you said you were going to do and you're letting us down and you're letting the company down and you're letting the customers down. And it was those moments where I would just feel so crappy. It was enough of those moments that made me realize that I don't have to be a victim of my circumstances. And I think that that's one of the things that I've really learned through the challenges You know, I know so many people in my life that it's always somebody else's fault, somebody else's, you know, something's fault. It's the employer, it's the economy, it's money, it's my spouse, it's my kids, it's the leaders at church, it's it's the lack of leadership at church, it's the teachers, it's it's everybody but me. And there were these moments, the the the, some of the toughest moments of my life, including when I went through my divorce, by the way, when I had to realize that the only way I could heal. And the only way I could become someone in something new was to take accountability for what it was that I'd done that led me to that moment in time. Yeah. Well, what do you say? I mean, I tend to take accountability for everything, you know, of how everyone's feeling in the house or how this. Sure. What what would you say about that? I mean, you may take accountability, but yeah, tell us about that. You can't do it. And here's the reason why. You know, there is only one person that can decide whether or not you have a happy life and whether or not you live stress-free. And that one singular person is you. And what we have a tendency to do is we have a tendency to kind of heap everybody else's problems and stress upon ourselves, and we don't detach from their life. We try to be so entrenched in their life and what they're going through, and we think that we're doing it to help them. But the reality is by always kind of commiserating with people when things aren't going well, there's a difference between empathy and commiserating. Let me be clear. I think it's massively important to show forth empathy and understanding. What's not okay is to sort of get down in the gutter of life with them and validate all these feelings of crappiness that they think they're having. Because when we go into the gutter with them and we validate their crappy life, we start to think that ours is crappy too. Mm -hmm. Well, and And then you don't help them take responsibility either, right? (laughs) not at all, right? You know, uh, I've got some close family members who this happens and they're kind of the people like, everything is bad. They're like Eeyore, you know, it's like rather boggy and sad. And and they're just kind of, everything is, you know, there's a rain cloud over them no matter how good life is going. And I used to, 
get down in the trenches with him and get in the gutter like, oh, it is hard. Oh, my gosh. Yes, it's so difficult for you. And guess what would happen when I would do that? I felt terrible. And guess what? It didn't help. It didn't help them feel any better. They think we think that we want somebody to just come down. We want people to understand. We don't need people to share in our misery, right? Because that does no good for anybody. When you multiply misery, all you get is more miserable, okay? Yeah. And so when I would get down in the trenches with them, like, yes, it's so bad. Everything is so terrible. Then as a human, we have this tendency to try to like one up their misery or, or at least match it, right? Oh, gosh, I know that's such a hard time. I remember when I went through this terrible time and this terrible thing happened. And then what happens is we go back to that moment in time when it was terrible. And now we feel crappy and they feel crappy. And it's this cycle of crappy. And that is not good for anybody. And it's this destructive cycle. And so what I found is when I have family members or friends that are in that place, my job is to give them hope for something different in the very near future. And if I can shift them from the misery and the bad, if I can let them know, listen, you know, hey, I'm sorry that you feel that way. And I'm sorry that that's happening to you. Notice I'm not just saying I'm sorry. I'm saying I'm sorry you feel that way. I'm sorry you feel that that's happening to you. So I'm validating to a certain extent, but I'm not just making some sort of sweeping broad declaration that life sucks for them. And by doing that, I can get down there with them and say, you know what? I'm really sorry that that's happening for you. But you know what? You know, as you were talking, I was thinking about how cool is it going to be when X, Y, Z, right? When this trial passes and the next door opens, when this moment goes away and some healing occurs, think of how awesome you'll feel. And so if I can move them from that state of misery into a place of hope, now I'm not taking on their crap and I'm also not validating their crap so they think they can just live and stew in it. And then that allows me to kind of stay above the fray and keep more of a positive energetic vibe in my life and infuse them with some of that as well. And I find that that is way more productive than just kind of getting down in the gutter with them. Yeah. Well, and you're not stirring up those negative emotions that cause, you know, your own feelings to feel that way, you know, to, to bring right. those back up. That's awesome. So we, you talked about how gratitude takes action steps. Do you feel like that's been your overall paradigm change or is there something oh, else yeah. that maybe? Totally. In the book, I call it the verbification of gratitude. So I made up the word verbification and I made up the word verbify <laughs> because I think that, that's what we have to do is we have to verbify gratitude. And when we can make it something that we do and something that's an active conscious decision that gets executed at very key strategic moments throughout the day, especially during moments of frustration, that changes it all. And that's what had to change for me. So if I take you into my story and how I got there, when I knew that gratitude needed to be a game changer for me, I started to do what everybody else did, right? Which is like, do a gratitude journal and go on a gratitude walk. By the way, not knocking those practices, they're good. However, and this is what I had to learn. When I was gratitude journaling, it wouldn't stick for me, okay? I would do it for like two weeks and then I'd be done. And I don't know why we do this, by the way, but I find that when I'm journaling and I stop journaling, whenever I go back to the journal, I like make an apology to the journal. I don't know why I do that. Or it's like, I'm like, I'm so sorry I haven't written in you for two weeks. I don't know why I apologize, <laughs> but I do. Every time. And so I would, I, I, the I'm journal. Because I do that too. <laughs> you, okay. <laughs> I see, I'm not alone. But the journal was filled with more apologies than it was good content stuff that would change my life. And I was going, man, why isn't this sticking? And here's what I came to realize when we simply feel gratitude for what's good, it can be powerful. There's some good that can take place there. But another one of my favorite quotes is from a man I greatly respect named Dieter F. Uchtdorf, who kind of shifts it and says, could I suggest that we see gratitude as a way of life? Could I suggest that we become thankful in life circumstances, not just thankful for things? See, if there's already stuff that's going well in our life and we're thankful for it, that's good. But how much more powerful is it when we can become thankful for the things that are frustrating or bad? The only way that that works is we've got to become active to the process because if we live like everybody else, which is when a bad thing happens, a frustration happens and we go commiserate with somebody else and we're just wandering around, you know, in Eeyoreville, like, oh, this thing happened and this sucks and that's not good. And and we kind of go to that place. We love 
love to stew in constant discontentment and just let that kind of wash over our life. In fact, I would go so far as to say that when people feel like they have a really bad day, they don't have a really bad day. They had one tiny frustration that they just hang on to and stew in it and tell everybody about it for the rest of the day, how bad it's going. And they go on Facebook and they rant about it. Yeah. And all of a sudden that what could have been a tiny little thing that could have been shifted instantly becomes this big sort of overarching theme for the day. Oh, today was so hard. Well, listen, if we can go take that moment and shift that and become thankful for that moment by being active, that's a game changer. When we are gratitude journaling and we're trying to be thankful for what's already really good, we are removing ourselves, generally speaking, from the present. And we're going, let me think about what was awesome yesterday. Let me think about, you know, man, I'm really thankful that, you know, yesterday that appointment went well. Okay, well, fine, but we removed ourselves from the present moment and we went back to go find something to be thankful for. The key is if we can become conscious to the frustrations of life and hardships as they show up, we stay present in that moment and then go through a process to become thankful in that circumstance, in that moment. We know that the only time we can affect our future is now, and we know that we cannot affect our past because it's in the past. So this whole process allows us to become very present and become able to really shift things. So I had to get away from gratitude journaling about stuff that happened yesterday, and I moved myself to let me try to become thankful in the moment for something. And immediately I'd look around and look for something that I could be thankful for, and I'd look up and I'd see lights and I'd go, I'm thankful I don't live in the dark. Now, that was a step in the right direction because I'm at least being thankful in the moment. But I still hadn't seen massive shifts take place in my life until I decided to become thankful for the frustrations when those showed up. And that was the biggest game changer for me. And it required an active process to become conscious to the frustration, to then find something good embedded in the frustration, to then trigger this active gratitude for the good embedded in the thing that was frustrating. And then that's how my life powered up and powered me forward to go and really change the rest of my life is it had to become these single moments that I had to find gratitude in, even though it seemed difficult to do so. Well, I love this idea because, I mean, how many times have we had an experience that was just horrible and horrific? And then when it's over, we can look back and go, oh, that was so you know, needed for this to happen in my life, for that to happen in my life. And that's one thing I guess I get frustrated with is like wanting to see, you know, I mean, how do we put those action steps in there, I guess, and really embrace the trial as we're going through it? Because, I mean, that's really, I think that is key, you know, because we know that when we look back on it, we're going to be grateful for that experience, but really enjoying the moment and being able to to appreciate the fact you're going yeah. through X, Y, or Z, that's really difficult. So let's kind of talk about those action steps. I mean, you talk about in your book, which is Flipping the Grad to Switch, that there's four daily action steps, and then there's one simple principle. I think this is like your subtitle. <laughs> one yeah, simple yeah. principle guaranteed to change the trajectory I can't say that word, trajectory (laughs) (laughs) Trajectory of your life forever. What is that? Let's go through the steps. So the simple principle is active gratitude, but the four steps are as follows. See, the reason why we call it flip the gratitude switch is because I came to realize when life would hand me frustrations, I could do this internal thing. And it felt like flipping a switch on. Like if you walk into a dark room, right? You walk into a dark room and you can't see anything. It's obviously going to be difficult to navigate that room. Now, with one simple, tiny little act, a simple flip of a switch, all of it can be illuminated. You can navigate the room more easily. If there was something in there that was beautiful, now you can recognize its beauty more efficiently because you can actually see it. And I felt like that's what was happening with me is I would get to these points where I wasn't just being thankful in the moment for what was already good, but I would take the frustration as soon as it came. And as soon as life would hand me a frustration, whether it was I stubbed my toe or whether it was uh, I got a rock chip or a flat tire or somebody cut me off or, uh, you know, I went to the store and they were out of 1% milk or, um, you know, my uh, 
coworker, you know, said a snide remark or my kids wrote on the wall with crayon or I dropped my toothbrush in the toilet, which, by the way, is a true story. Um, it, it did it or I spilled uh, Diet Coke on my pants as I'm going to the airport, which is another real story. So all of these tiny little things that would happen rather than sort of have that happen and go, oh, my gosh, you serious right now? Like, come on. I would just go, whoa, 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 wait, hey, okay, cool. So I'm feeling frustrated, right? So something happened that isn't awesome. I don't feel great about this thing that just happened, so now what can I do? And this is how you flip that internal uh. switch and what I call flip the gratitude switch. And what I did is I created a formula that goes with the acronym FLIP. So you're literally flipping the gratitude switch and the four steps are embedded in that name, flip the gratitude switch. That was great. I love that idea because there are tiny little things that can happen like throughout your day that just make, I mean, by the time the day's over, you're just, you know, raving mad at everything. So does it come down to checking those emotions? It totally does. So the first step, in fact, the first step of Flip the Gratitude Switch is to find the frustration. So like we know when we feel frustrated. So I'll give you one of my favorite stories is uh, of how I did this was when I was literally traveling to New York. And as I was driving uh, to the airport in Salt Lake, I wanted to get a Diet Coke. And so I, I went to McDonald's, $1 Diet Coke, you know, high five me. And for those of you out there that are health nuts and judging me for drinking Diet Coke, <laughs> lay off. Okay. <laughs> um, so I go and get my Diet Coke. And I pay my, my dollar plus tax and I go to the second window and they are handing me my cup. And as I, I'm looking at the cup as it's coming out the window and I'm going, you know, that cup doesn't exactly look stable. I kind of feel like that cup got sat on by one of the workers and then they just pulled it out of the chair and were like, let's put coconut in it. Give it to this guy. And I'm looking at this cup. The top isn't even like properly on, but I didn't want to like be, you know, oh, guys, can you get me a different cup? I'm just... They hand it to me as it comes in my car window. Guess what happens? I grab it. Boom. The top comes off. It spills on my pants. I'm on my way to the airport for a five-hour flight to New York where I have to get off and go speak. And I, all my change of clothes are going to be in my bag. So, you know, here I am. I And now I've got to go to the airport and I've got, you know, Coke on my pants. He's dying, this, And I'm frustrated. And I knew I was frustrated immediately. And so now I'm at the moment of choice. And the choice is... I let that frustration stick with me and I grumble about the Diet Coke and I yell at the worker like, and then they give me another one and then I'm still mad but it doesn't change the fact that I still have wet pants and I go to the airport and I'm angry at the TSA person and, and I sit down you know, next to somebody on the flight and I'm angry to them and I go and show up in New York and now I'm not in a good state of mind to be able to try to move an audience to action and give them something that could be beneficial. I knew that all of that would happen if I didn't change the trajectory of that one. One moment. So F is you find the frustration. I'm frustrated. I'm frustrated that this Diet Coke got spilled on me, but now I have this opportunity to do something about it. I always say you give the frustration a high five, like, what's up, frustration? Welcome to the party. Let's <laughs> hang out and do some stuff together, right? <laughs> yeah. So I've got the frustration, and now I move on to L. L is the second step in the process, which is to look for what's awesome. So now I take that immediate frustration and I look for something awesome embedded in the frustration. So here's the way that that works. I spill Diet Coke on my pants. So let me try to find something that's awesome. Okay, why am I here getting a Diet Coke in the first place? Because I live in America where there's drive throughs I can drive to any restaurant that I want to and hand over a couple pieces of paper and get food. You know, there's a lot of people in the world that couldn't really do that, so that's pretty cool. And you know, why am I even here getting a Diet Coke? Because I'm on my way to the airport. Why am I going to the airport? Because I get to do what I love, which is to speak. Oh my gosh, I have somebody paying me to fly to New York, which is an awesome city, to go and speak to a group of amazing people, and I get paid to go do that. Holy cow, I'm like totally living my dream. I look around at my car and I go, I am in this, I, this car's awesome. I love this car. I'm in my car, right? Some people don't even have a car. And so what happens is what's called the virtuous cycle. When you start to become thankful for one thing, especially inside of a frustration, your mind opens up to all of the other yeah. things you can be thankful for, but you've got to start somewhere. Yeah, it's like a domino effect, right? That all of a sudden you're seeing how great everything is. So F is find the frustration. L, I didn't get that again. What's Look your... for what's awesome. Oh, awesome. Okay, look for what's awesome. Okay. Yep. And, and then... you know the chief officer of awesome needs to look for what's awesome, right? I mean. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's... What, what's I? 
<laughs> so I is then you initiate gratitude. So now you go F, find the frustration, L, look for what's awesome. Now you take that list of the stuff that you found that's awesome and you choose to literally trigger and experience gratitude for that list of what's awesome. So you will start to feel a shift in you when you start to find the awesome. But what I'm saying is you take a moment and you take that list and now you don't just acknowledge, right, that, hey, you know, I'm, I'm flying to New York, but you really take a moment and maybe even close your eyes and you go, you know, I am really thankful that I get to do what I love. By saying those words, I'm really thankful for, and then inserting one of the things that you found in your list of awesome, it becomes now the active process to choose to experience gratitude for the thing that was awesome embedded in the frustration. And when you initiate gratitude and you're activating that gratitude, it immediately moves you into the fourth step, which is P, where you do something that I call powering up with grata fuel. Because I think that gratitude fuels life and it really can fuel every aspect of life. Before we go on, let's listen to this message. Hey, Firestarters, are you looking for a new way to listen to the Luminous Mind? Try listening on Stitcher. Haven't heard of Stitcher? Think of it as radio on demand. You can listen to the Luminous Mind anytime, anywhere. There is no downloading, no syncing, no wasted memory. Just stream your favorite podcast such as The Luminous Mind. Stitcher is available on iOS, Android, Nook, iPad, and also from your favorite internet browser. Don't have Stitcher? Download it free today at Stitcher.com or in the App Store. And make sure you rate and review The Luminous Mind so together we can continue to light minds on fire and change the paradigm of education. Encouraging others with his message of flipping the gratitude switch. And what happens is when you initiate gratitude, your body will trigger a dopamine release. And dopamine is the reward chemical and it makes you want to do awesome stuff and feel awesome and go be awesome. So gratitude is one of the easiest ways to trigger dopamine. By the way, dopamine is what gets people addicted to drugs. It's not just the drug. It's the release that gets created. It's what can get people addicted to things like pornography. They want this dopamine rush. So this is a healthy, wholesome, amazing way that's frankly more powerful and more effective to get a dopamine release. And when you initiate gratitude, that dopamine floods your body. And what it feels like to me is I kind of feel like Super Mario Brothers. Like I just ate a mushroom and I just got like twice as big, right? <laughs> you just feel amazing. And that gratifuel, you power up and it pushes you forward. And what happens is that can fuel you until the very next frustration arises. When it does, you find the frustration, look for what's awesome, initiate gratitude, power up with gratifuel. It moves you to the next thing. And so that's why I say that a single frustration, you can change the trajectory of that moment and you're more likely to change the trajectory of the next moment and the next moment. And that's how over time, compounding moments change the entire trajectory of your life by simply isolating and finding the frustration and then going through the flip process so you can flip your internal gratitude switch and just choose to be happy instead of choose to let the frustration wash over you. Well, I love this step because um, like we discussed before, you know, the gratitude journal, gr taking gratitude walk. I'm a busy person. <laughs> I, don't have time. Yeah, right, just, right. I don't have time to sit down and do this, but I love this because it seems like once you get this pattern down, it's a quick flip. I mean, it's a quick thing it that is. can happen. And, you know, a busy person can start instituting gratitude into their life just by, like you said, that flip of the switch. And it just sounds like it just snowballs into, because once you find the frustration and you look for things that are awesome, when you start to initiate gratitude, I mean, it just seems like, I mean, once you find the things that's awesome, the rest of it's just rolling, right? Oh, yeah. So. Totally. And you nailed it. And, you know, what you said that was so powerful there is that you can do it anytime. You don't need a pen and a pencil. 
You don't need to go on a walk. You can literally sit in the moment wherever you are and inside of 30 seconds change your life because you find the frustration, look for what's awesome, initiate gratitude, and you will automatically feel awesome and it will drive you to go and be more awesome and be kinder to people and serve more and give more and provide more value for humanity. And it really can be done in your mind, in the moment, wherever you are, no matter what. And you said you've had this happen now, like you're an eternal optimist, right? I mean, it's possible if you're using this flip, you know, action step, correct? Yeah, because check this out. Now the glass isn't just half full. It, It is half full, but it's one of two additional things. It's either refillable or it's perfectly enough, right? And that's the key because if we can get out of suffering out in the poverty of endless discontentment and we can step into a wealth of possibility, now we look at that glass and it's not just half empty. Even if it's full on empty, we can look at it as either refillable or just enough. Why is it enough? Because it's exactly what it is right now. And because it is what it is, we get to use it for our benefit, whatever that looks like. If it's taking it to the faucet to go refill it, fine. If it's just acknowledging that somebody was genius enough to create a glass and I've used glasses my whole life to drink things so I'm not drinking out of my hands, great. I use that and become thankful for that. There's just so many things that you can shift your mind into acknowledging that life looks completely different. In the book, I call it making the shift from constantly sliding on lenses of limitation to putting on a pair of gratitude glasses because it literally changes the way you view everyone and everything around you. Well, and this is probably what you see in, I mean, this is how I am anyway, in everyone's life is that I'm always waiting for something to happen to be happy. Does that make sense? Like I'm just waiting for like this next big deal to happen or a a trip to come or, you know, something like that. But this actually lets you feel, you know, happy in that moment and become that eternal optimist, right? You nailed it. That's exactly right. In the book, I call it, I say that mankind is diagnosed with this terrible disease called waiting for the futuritis, yeah. right? And it's, it's always about, oh, the next job is going to be the one. The next deal is going to be the one. The next vacation, the next whatever. It's always about what's going to come, not what is. And if we can become thankful for what is, it changes everything because now we're not just focused on something that isn't in the immediate because we can't get to where we want to go to unless we do something right now in this moment and flipping the gratitude switch allows us to do that. That's cool. So you said that this has become kind of like your new thing that you're doing. Uh, Tell us, like, what's going on around this book? Are you Uh, mentoring people? Um, And maybe what have you learned from mentoring people and from mentoring others? You know, I, I gotta tell you, it's a little surreal to mentor other people because half the time the people who I'm sharing information with are older than, I'm 37, and they're, you know, 10, 15, 20 years older than me. One of my, my high school teacher bought the book. She's, she was my music teacher in high school. She's been blown away by it. And she posted on Facebook and she said, I can't believe that I got to be your teacher and now you're becoming my teacher. And to me, that's just sort of surreal because she was my high school teacher, right? I mean, I, she was my music teacher from the time I was in sixth grade all through high school. And for her to say she's learning something from me is really surreal. And here's what I've realized is that mentorship is vital for all of us and that we don't have to focus on who the mentor is. We simply have to focus on what we need to be mentored on. And I know for me, I have unbelievable mentors show up in my life on a regular basis. And I think that for others, they're kind of blown away that this you know, punk kid, me, is showing up as a mentor for them. And what I've learned, there's a couple things I've learned. I've learned that every single one of us is struggling Now, even if life is happy and things are going well, there are still things we're struggling with and still things that we need to address. You know, whether you are massively wealthy and have everything you could possibly want, you've got your own demons that you're struggling with. If you are at the bottom of the barrel and you're homeless, not a cent to your name, there are things you're struggling with. Everybody in between, regardless of status, economic status, political affiliation, uh, work profile, um, gender, uh, whether or not you've got kids, whether or not you're married, everybody has something. And I noticed that the people that I mentor, every one of them fall into the same category. And this is a category that's, you know, this is really important. Every single one of them is, you ready for it? Human. And as a human, 
we have struggles and things that we deal with. And I'm a human, so I need to be mentored. And I have unlikely mentors come into my life all the time. One of my most unlikely mentors is my seven-year-old daughter or my five-year-old son or my two-year-old boy who the second that we give him anything says, thank you. We we get in the car after going somewhere awesome. My two-year-old says, thank you so much for taking us. And I go, He's thankful for this little thing that maybe I wouldn't have even thought of. He just became my mentor. That's cool. My daughter, yeah. who maybe hears me say, oh, you know, gosh, I really want this thing to take place for me. Maybe I haven't flipped the gratitude switch yet. She can acknowledge it and go, well, daddy, and she can walk me through the flip formula. She can do that because she's done it. And so I have these mentors that show up in an unbelievable way, and I get to show up for others as a mentor, and we all have this same thing in common that we're human and we've got stuff that we're dealing with and we've got to address it and we need ways and and ideas and thoughts in order to move us just one step further and one step down the road to become something better, become something more, be the thing that we've been called to become and we're all in that place regardless of our state in life. And I think that's really cool. I've really been able to zone in or zero in on that and understand that. And it's given me such an unbelievable acceptance of where I'm at in my life and realize that my journey is so different than yours or anybody listening. But I just get to be thankful for mine because it's mine and it's my gift and I get to use it. And it's amazing. Well, and we were kind of talking about this before we began, like as far as learning and having mentors and coaches Don't you feel like that's part of once you start grasping hold of gratitude and really start, I mean, this sounds like it's like becoming embedded in your soul. You know, once it once it does, you can see those mentors for who they are and have an appreciation for that. I think a lot of us, you know, we are looking for this one perfect mentor when in fact, when we start having gratitude in our lives, we can be taught by anyone, anytime, anywhere. Correct. Absolutely. And I think that that's the key. And by the way, this introduces another point of why gratitude is so important. And I don't actually even get into this in the book. But one of the things that gratitude can do is gratitude is the greatest way to silence the ego and increase humility. Oh, yeah. And then that, like I said, opens it up for us to be taught by other people, right? (laughs) Yeah, because now I don't have to look at somebody and feel like they have had to accomplish X, Y, and Z in order to be my mentor. I just get to be thankful that they showed up at the moment that they did, and I get to view them for what they are, which is my mentor right now. And I get to be thankful for whatever they're sharing with me and for me. Now, I still seek out mentors and invest significant chunks of money to be mentored by people who have been there, who have done it, that I already know I can learn from. Yeah. But this but this is is what's so vital. I know a lot of people that if you don't pose, I know a lot of people that look at life like this. Hey, you, if you don't pose an immediate direct financial benefit to me, I don't have time for you. And when you have gratitude and you can increase humility and and eliminate the ego, now when that person comes into your experience, you just get to give whatever you've got and they're going to probably do the same and you get to be mutually uplifted because you realize they're a human, you're a human. And because you're together right now at this moment, there's some sort of benefit you can each gain from the interaction and be better off as a result of the interaction as opposed to, hey, you over there, hey, you don't have no money for me, I ain't got nothing for you, right? Because that's not... Not the way we're supposed to interact with each other. We need to be givers, not takers. Yeah. And gratitude has really allowed me to, to kind of get more into that place and into that space of realizing that it's about the value that can be found in any human interaction and having gratitude for that as opposed to, you know, looking at life and people in sort of a different way like I used to, which is do you pose a benefit to me? If you don't, you know, I don't really have time for you. It's been a big shift for me. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, and I I don't want to spend too much time on this, but one other thought that came to my mind as you were talking about that is that all of a sudden you create like this feeling of knowing that somebody must love you that put this teacher in your path. You know, that's right. we we have a wonderful saying that I've said it on our podcast a lot. I don't know who I picked it up from, somebody who was on our show, but they talked about when the the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And, you know, that goes back to God's there watching over you, knowing your path and helping you get down that road. And and again, this is this is the beauty of finding the frustration, whatever life throws at you, rather than look at it as a problem or a pitfall or a, a pot mark in your life, a pothole in your life. You get to view it for what it is, which is that moment it's showing up as the teacher. 
like you just said. And that moment, that hardship, that trial, that frustration, that person, it is for your benefit. It is part of your human experience. So when you flip the gratitude switch with it, you can view it for what it really is. And that is what ends up changing your life. That's great. Well, earlier on, you talked about how you love to go to conferences and read different books. And I noticed on your website, you have a must read book section. Which, Which book do you think has really been the most influential? And then tell me why. Oh my gosh. You know, all of those books are massive game changers for me, but I'll tell you the book that I feel like has had the most profound impact on my life is a book called The Go-Giver. And the author of The Go-Giver is a gentleman by the name of Bob Berg, and he wrote it with another guy by the name of John David Mann. And Bob Berg and John David Mann wrote this book, and it's a really simple parable. I mean, it's only like 150 pages. And in it, it teaches the five laws of stratospheric success. And what it taught me is this really powerful, valuable truth, which is you have to give significantly more value than you ask for in return if you ever want to create success in this life. And it teaches me that the real law of influence is how abundantly you place other people's interests ahead of your own. And it shifted me from sort of this selfish kind of brat to realizing that success in life comes through one very profound truth. And that truth is give and serve and understand that it will come back over time, but you don't have to be attached to when it comes back. You just have to give, you just get to provide value. And my friend, you know, the author, Bob, I had no idea who he was. He um, has become a friend over the last couple years, and I'm so thankful because he's such a hero of mine in writing this book. And he has this phrase that I love, and he says that, you know, when it comes to money and success, money is the thunderclap to values lightning, meaning you've got to give value, and money comes as the byproduct of doing that. And so now everything I do in my life – I don't think about, is it going to make me money? How much is it going to make me? You know, how many dollars can I make off you or the, it's just, you know, let me just give. And I found that with my message of flip the gratitude switch, I would literally give the book away for free to everybody that would have it if they would let me. But the problem is if I gave it away to everybody for free, they wouldn't value it enough to read it. But when they invest (laughs) $20 of their money or $14 of their money, if they buy it on audible, when they do that, they are far more likely to interact with the message and take it as something real. And so I just get to pour my heart and soul into the book and into doing things like this and letting people know that the ideas are out there and they exist. If the ideas are good enough and people want them, they'll buy the book. And if there's enough books that are sold, then I'll be able to feed my family, right? But it's not, I wrote the book to make money. It's, I wrote the book to have a way to communicate principles of truth that are powerful. And if it's good enough and if I provide enough value over a long enough sustained period of time, the rest kind of takes care of itself. And that was such a game-changing idea for me that it's about giving value and it's about giving more than it's about getting. Yeah. And that has totally shifted the entire way I look at everything I do. Yeah, you always hear about the go-getter, but we never right. hear about the go-giver. So yeah. that's an awesome, awesome way to, to look at life and how, how we can change it. So do you feel like other than these four action steps, is there any other habit in your personal life that you feel has been really helpful? Yeah, you know, the other habit actually comes from another one of the books on my list, which is a book that my good friend Hal Elrod, who wrote the book called The Miracle Morning, um, he actually wrote the foreword for the book Flip the Gratitude Switch. And Hal's a really good buddy of mine. And Hal wrote a book that changed my life called The Miracle Morning. And what he talks about is you may not think you're a morning person, but when you get up in the morning and do these six things, um, it can totally change the trajectory of your life as well. And that gave me the time and the space to be able to write the book. And now early mornings are sort of like this thing that I fear and I hate, but it's these (laughs) quiet moments where I get to tap into the most divine pieces of what my existence um, really is. And I get to go to God and I get to pray and I get to, you know, study things that are important to me and I get to, you know, meditate and focus and clear my head and I get to have productive time to work on things that can really have a profound impact. And had I not read The Miracle Morning and it had Hal not come into my life, I would have continued to look at life as it's hard to get up in the morning. I'm not a morning person. And Excuses, it's really difficult yeah. for yeah, it's really difficult for me if I don't get more, you know, if I only get a couple hours of sleep, I can't be productive the next day. All of that has gone away for me and it's created an environment where I can thrive now. And so that's been the other thing is realizing that creating space for me to have time for me to do what I'm called to do 
is a must. And many of us go through life having the excuse that there's not enough time. I guarantee you there's enough time. It's just a question of whether or not you're willing to pay the price to find it. Well, and getting up early, I I was laughing because I feel the same way, you know, when I get up early, I'm like, oh, I don't want to do this. But but once you get into it, it seems like once you do have one of those early morning, you know, miracle mornings, then it seems like you're able to focus on the things that really matter. And when I don't do that, I'm just like floundering all over the place. But that's right. It's really true. Awesome. Every single book we could go through every single book on my must read list and I could tell you how it's changed my life and the impact that it's had on me. But the practice practice of providing more value and giving more than I'm asking for and then realizing that the way I achieve what I'm supposed to do in this life, what I feel like God has called me to do is for me to get rid of the excuse that I don't have time and for me to love myself and my mission enough to carve out the time to work on it. Because if I don't, I will die with my message and nobody will have it. I won't be able to give the good that I've got because I didn't love my message and love myself and love my mission enough to carve out time for me to focus on it. We get so caught up in the day to day. We get so caught up in work and kids that we rarely will give ourselves the gift of working on our own life's mission. And the Miracle Morning really gave me the environment to create that time that sometimes is only a half hour, but that's enough in a day that might just be enough. And uh, it's really been a game changer for me. And I encourage anybody listening to realize if you love your life and you love your mission and you love what you've been called to do enough, you will carve out the time with doing whatever it takes in order to get it out to the world. Otherwise, you just don't love your mission enough. Well, in a few minutes a day really makes a big difference over the long haul. So even if it's only a few minutes, great. You know, you know, listen, if you want to write a book, Rebecca, you know this, but if you want to write a book and you think I don't have the time, you know what, write a sentence today. Yeah, the the only time I have is in the morning to write. So I totally get it. But it's like, write, you know, write a sentence. If you can't don't write the book today, write a sentence. And then tomorrow, write another sentence. And over time, you're going to have enough sentences that you might just have a book that you can work with. So even if it's just something that simple and doing something that little, that can begin to change your ability to fulfill your life's mission. That's that's great. Well, tell us, what are some long-term goals that you have for yourself? And how do you feel like that's working into your legacy? You know, what would that legacy be? You know, the most important thing when I think of legacy and what I want to achieve, it's this. I want my kids to grow up realizing that gratitude can play an active part of their everyday experience and that it can change everything. And I want them to teach it to their kids. I mean, that is truly the most valuable thing I can give to the world. I said when I wrote the book, even if it never sells a single copy, and thankfully we've sold some copies, but um, <laughs> you know, but even if I never sell a single copy, A, the book has changed me. B, I can give something to my kids that will hopefully give them what I feel like the greatest gift has been in my life, which is understanding this active power of active gratitude in life's frustrations. But beyond that, you know, if I, if I go outside of my family, I have always wanted to be a speaker. I, you know, I've been doing it for years and now I'm really starting to, to break into a couple areas that I'm really thrilled with. I don't know um, if anybody's familiar, you know, with a, a conference that is held for LDS youth called EFY, but that changed my life. And I've always wanted to be an EFY speaker. Um, and it looks like that might be happening in the next year. Yeah, um, and I'm really thankful for that. I mean, that's something that I love to reach out to youth and I love to share things. I love speaking in middle schools and high schools because I get to teach these kids these principles that nobody else is talking about and it can totally change their entire life and I love that. And so I just want to keep sharing the message. I want to keep speaking. I want to keep being on stages because I know that that can make a difference for people and I know speakers have made a huge difference in my life and have been a huge benefit for me and I get to go do that for others and that's that's awesome. You know, as far as Flip the Gratitude Switch goes, we'll do a kids illustrated version of the book and I imagine we'll do a whole series, you know, Flip the Gratitude Switch for parents, Flip the Gratitude Switch for divorcees, you know, Flip the Gratitude Switch <laughs> for business owners, for entrepreneurs because there are elements of the gratitude switch and active gratitude that could be applied in any one of those life experiences that could be really powerful and beneficial. And, you know, the book right now goes over a really great general, you know, approach, but we can get even more specific. And so there will be more to come. And in the meantime, we're just going to keep getting the message out, trying to get the books in as many hands as possible and trying to get on as many stages as possible to share this idea with as many folks as possible. Because my goal, my real goal 
is if we could change a million lives one flip at a time, if we could have a million people understanding that a single flip of the gratitude switch, even if it's just once a day, could change the trajectory of the day, the ripple effect that that will create, we will not be able to calculate. And it could literally raise the collective consciousness and positivity of the world, even just one million people flipping the gratitude switch regularly and consistently because the way they'll interact with life and others will be different than it would have been. And so I just want to change the world one tiny flip at a time. And I want to start by at least getting a million people knowing about and consistently flipping the gratitude switch. Well, and I just think that is a, an amazing legacy because I mean, you get gratitude into people's hearts and the whole world and the whole world changes. And like you said, the humility comes back, you know, where we're able to to really take responsibility for our lives. And, you know, amazing. I love that. Thank you. And you're welcome. B- before we say goodbye, do you have any final parting words of advice for our listeners? And then give us your contact information, how we can get in touch with you. Yeah, absolutely. You know, a couple things that I'd love to share that are just some of my favorite things to share. One of them is a quote from Viktor Frankl, who wrote um, a book called Man's Search for Meaning. And, you know, he was a Holocaust survivor. And in the beginning of the book, he has this amazing quote, and I won't read it all, but I'll share this. He says, success will show up precisely because you forget to think about it. And I just feel that there's so much value in that. If you can focus on serving others and giving tremendous value in everything you do and focus on making every interaction you have with another human one where they feel better off for having had that interaction – you will play your part in changing the world and you will be successful precisely because you aren't thinking about being successful. You're thinking about giving and providing value and making an impact. That's the first thing. And the second thing is this. I feel like while flip the gratitude switch is the biggest game changer for me, you know, here's the deal. There's really a two-step formula to complete an unrestrained joy and happiness. One of them is to flip the gratitude switch and to find joy in life's frustrations with gratitude. The second is imagine If we woke up every morning with this primary focus on our minds, I'm going to serve one person one time selflessly today. Imagine if everybody woke up with that thought on their mind and imagine that you compound that with finding gratitude in life's frustrations. What would the world look like? What would your world look like if those were your prevailing thoughts at the beginning of the day? So I want to leave that with everybody because I feel like that could be such a massive game changer for you and really for all of us. And then as far as finding me, Facebook, you know, is a great way. Uh, Twitter, I'm at Kevin Clayson. I'm on Instagram at Kevin Clayson. I'm on LinkedIn. If you just Google search Kevin Clayson, C-L-A-Y-S-O-N is the last name, you'll be able to find me. Uh, You can also email me at Kevin at KevinClayson.com. And I love to be really responsive and interact with you. Um, And also go to KevinClayson.com, the website. You can see the book list. Uh, I've got all my social media contact info there. I've got, I'll have this podcast listed on the website as well as others that I've been interviewed on if you want to hear those also and I've got links to the book and links to my speaking services and all kinds of stuff so kevinclayson.com is a great hub but yeah social media email um, and please it, you know if this podcast has had an impact on you reach out to me I'd love to interact with you and Rebecca I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for letting me come and be here with you you're so incredible what an incredible mission you're on here and I'd love to serve you and your audience in any way I can that's awesome well and who wouldn't want to be you know friends or whatever with the chief officer of awesome because it's it right? is expected to be awesome <laughs> yes awesome. it's kind of it kind of has to be you know <laughs> that's great well once again his contact information is kevinclayson.com you can also go to flip the gratitude switch.com i would that's right. to get the the book but we will be sure to also link everything that we talked about including the books and different things on our website as well so thank you so much again kevin for joining us and helping to light our minds on fire absolutely thank you Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind. To learn more about Kevin Clayson, go to our show notes at theluminousmind.net. Be sure to become a subscriber to our free email list and get our updates. Then check out our services tab to see how we can continue to assist you, our fire starters. Also, to help us continue production of illuminating content, go to the sponsor tab at theluminousmind.net for more information on sponsorship and affiliate programs. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, Google+, Pinterest, and now Instagram. Get our free audio content by subscribing on YouTube, iTunes, and Stitcher. 
To help us grow, consider these easy ways. Tell your friends about us. Leave us a review. Share our content. Tell us how we can help you so together we can continue to light minds on fire and change the paradigm of education. 